Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this webinar titled Large Scale Food Fortification, an underutilized strategy for addressing zinc deficiency. We're very delighted to welcome you to the conversation today. And this conversation is co convened by uh, the International Zinc uh, Nutrition Consultative Group, or iZinc, and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN. And uh, we'll, we'll be presenting the comprehensive or extensive work that has been carried out by iZinc's Zinc Fortification Task Force. So by way of introduction, my name is Mdutu Zimbuya. I'm with GAIN, and I'm a member of the task force I just mentioned. We'll be sharing bios of uh, the speakers and moderators in the chat so that we keep to time. Um, and a few housekeeping issues before we get into what will be a well-fortified program. So first, if you have any questions to the speakers uh, or to the panel, please keep these in mind as you participate. Please post them uh, in the Q&A box. We will do a short Q&A after the panel discussion, and any remaining questions will be addressed in writing after the webinar. Um, so as I mentioned, speaker and panelist bios will be shared in the chat so that we save time. And we encourage you to use the chat function to share an experience uh, with other colleagues or to comment uh, or interact generally. But please note that we will not answer questions in, uh, questions in the chat. We'll monitor the Q&A uh, function. And without further ado, uh, let's go straight to the presenters. So what we'll hear from our presenters today is that they'll share an overview of the global state of zinc deficiency first, and they'll present the evidence behind zinc fortification as a strategy to prevent uh, to, to address this deficiency. They will illustrate the current zinc fortification landscape and also demonstrate the potential impact of scaling up uh, food fortification with zinc and what priority actions countries can take. And then following the presentations, I'll host a conversation with representatives from two West African countries so that we can hear from them about their fortification experiences. And then we'll have um, a brief Q&A before we close out. Uh, so first, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome uh, Christine McDonald who will be our first presenter. Um, now that she's um, online, thank you, uh, Christine. So I'll hand over to you to take us through your first presentation. In speaker mode. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emdu, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'll start the Sorry. webinar. By Sorry, Christine, if you, if you can switch to presentation mode. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you see my screen? Okay. No? Oh, good. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, good. great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to start off the webinar, and I'll I'll start by giving a brief overview of zinc deficiency. I'll share some background information on iZinc, and we'll touch on the goals and key activities of the Zinc Fortification Task Force. So zinc is an essential mineral that serves many vital functions in the body. Uh, from a clinical perspective, zinc is important for immune function, reproductive health, child growth, and development. As with many other micronutrients, animal source foods are richest in bioavailable zinc, and infants, young children, and pregnant women are most vulnerable to deficiency. There are several adverse outcomes that are associated with zinc deficiency. Um, these include an increased risk of diarrhea and respiratory infections in young children, um, an increased risk of child stunting or growth faltering, an increased risk of preterm birth, and ultimately an increased risk of child mortality. Um, in the 2013 Lancet series, uh, it was estimated that approximately 116,000 child deaths are attributable to zinc deficiency each year. Um, it's estimated that uh, zinc deficiency is a public health problem in 40 low and middle income countries. Uh, 18 of these countries um, have an estimated prevalence of inadequate zinc, zinc intake above 25%, as well as an estimated prevalence of child stunting above 20%. 
18 countries have a prevalence of low plasma or serum zinc concentrations among women of reproductive age or preschool children that's above 20%. And four, an additional four countries meet all three criteria. So I thought it might be helpful just to give a bit of background information on iZinc. So the International Zinc Nutrition Consultative Group is an international group whose primary objectives are to promote and assist efforts to reduce the global burden of zinc deficiency. Um, we focus on the identification, prevention, and treatment of zinc deficiency uh, in the most vulnerable populations in low and middle income countries. Um, iZinc was established in 2000 um, and has undergone various phases of activity. Uh, between 2016 and 2022, iZinc's uh, core activities were supported uh, by a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I served as the director of iZinc during that period. Um, however, since then, we've been able to sustain selected activities related to zinc fortification with support from the International Zinc Association. Um, this slide, slide summarizes some of the key activities of iZinc um, that were conducted uh, between 2016 and 2022, um, but today we'll be focusing on the work of the Zinc Fortification Task Force. Um, the Zinc Fortification Task Force was formed in 2019 uh, with the goal of assessing the efficacy and effectiveness of zinc fortification interventions and to identify opportunities to enhance impact. Um, volunteer representatives from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the Food Fortification Initiative, uh, Nutrition International, and iZinc, um, including uh, representatives from UCSF, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UC Davis, and Johns Hopkins University, um, currently serve and have served on the Zinc Fortification Task Force. Um, and over the last uh, four years, the task force has pursued many priority activities. We started by conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis of large-scale food fortification with zinc to demonstrate the efficacy and effectiveness of this intervention. We conducted a series of key informant interviews to identify potential barriers to and enablers of large-scale food fortification, including zinc. Um, then we uh, moved to a more um, kind of advocacy-oriented um, phase of the project and developed um, a case study that highlighted wheat flour fortification in Cameroon, um, and as well as uh, several resources, uh, such as the development of a call to action document, three country briefs, uh, a quick facts document um, highlighting some, some key facts related to zinc fortification, um, as well as a short advocacy video. Um, today, you'll be learning um, about a, a major activity led by Ryan Wessels that summarized um, the potential effects of zinc fortification using food balance sheet data um, and, and the effects of that scaling up large scale food fortification on the estimated uh, prevalence of inadequate zinc intake. Um, we also conducted a separate activity related to cost effectiveness of zinc fortification as an intervention um, in Burkina Faso. Um, several resources um, that I just mentioned are available on our website, so I would um, encourage you to refer to those if you're interested in learning, learning more. And finally, I'd just like to thank all members of the task force for their contributions of time and effort over the last few years. Um, to, I also wanted to thank uh, today's speakers and panelists uh, for being part of the webinar today. Uh, to Kristen Sundell and Sonia Perrier from GAIN for their assistance coordinating all of the logistics um, and to the International Zinc Association for their financial support and making today's webinar poss possible. So with that, I'll pass it uh, back to Emdu. Thank you very much, Christine. I appreciate your walkthrough and um, we appreciate your leadership uh, of the whole process leading up to today. Um, right now, I would like to uh, turn over to Marie Menger to uh, give us a global overview of uh, food fortification with zinc. So over to you, Marie. Thank you so much, Mdu. Um, my presentation today will provide an overview of food fortification in general, uh, followed by the evidence supporting food fortification as a strategy for addressing zinc deficiency, and lastly, giving an overview of the status of food fortification in countries where zinc deficiency is a public health problem.
Food fortification, in brief, is the addition of vitamins and minerals to widely consumed or staple foods. When implemented well, food fortification is effective. A systematic review found that iron fortified foods can reduce the likelihood of developing anemia by 34%, iodine fortified salt can reduce the risks of goiter by 74%, and folic acid fortified flour can reduce the risk of neural tube defects by 41%. Fortification is cost effective. It is estimated that every dollar invested in food fortification generates, generates $27 in economic returns from disease prevention, improved earnings, and enhanced work productivity. Fortification is not a silver bullet, but can be an essential part of a strategy to fight micronutrient deficiencies. It works best when mandated, is well implemented, with high coverage and quality, and as part of a comprehensive public health nutrition strategy. In fact, in May 2023, um, the 76th World Health Assembly passed a resolution that calls on member states and the WHO De Director General to take specific actions to deploy food fortification as a critically important tool in the fight against malnutrition, including supporting, strengthening, and expanding food fortification programs where appropriate. This map shows you the status of cereal grain um, fortification globally as of November 2023. Um, cereal grains are common vehicles for a wide variety of micronutrients. Um, we can see that 94 countries have legislation to mandate fortification of at least one industrially milled cereal grain. Of these, 93 countries mandate fortification of wheat, uh, wheat flour alone in combination with other grains, and only one country um, has a mandate of only rice fortification. Oops. Now I'm going to move to the evidence um, for um, uh, zinc, for food fortification with zinc. Um, in 2019, we recognized the need to update our own systematic review on zinc fortification. We conducted a systematic review of zinc fortification alone or in combination with other micronutrients on plasmas and serum zinc concentrations and other zinc related um, biomarkers, child anthropometry, morbidity, mor uh, mortality, cognition and adverse effects. Um, after screening, we included 59 studies, 54 of which were uh, used in meta-analyses. More than half of the vehicles in the trials were cereal grains and the rest uh, milk and condiments. Um, and a median of 4.4 milligrams of zinc was consumed per day in the trials, um, of which 71% were conducted in low and middle income countries. What we found was that zinc fortification increased plasma and serum zinc concentrations with a corresponding 24 to 55% decrease in the prevalence of zinc deficiency across study designs. This slide shows um, a forest plot um, of the individual and pooled odds ratios for the prevalence of zinc deficiency in effectiveness studies, i.e. studies closer to a real life situation where zinc was part of the fortification premix alongside other micronutrients. As you can see, the groups receiving the fortified food were 55% less likely to be zinc deficient compared with the groups receiving the control food. We also found that fortification with zinc and other micronutrients um, may increase child weight, reduce episodes of diarrhea and fever, and improve cognitive function. However, there are very few studies assessing morbidity and cognitive function. Furthermore, no adverse outcomes from food fortification with zinc were found. Our systematic review informed the new 2022 WHO guidelines for fortification of wheat flour. Um, fortification of zinc is now included um, as a conditional recommendation in this, uh, this new guideline or updated from the interim guideline. What about cost effectiveness? 
there is limited evidence of cost effectiveness of zinc fortification. Um, but as, as you can see from, um, from food fortification in general, um, the evidence is convincing. Um, however, thanks to the team behind Minimod, the micronutrient intervention modeling tool, we have some data from the two countries we'll, we will hear from um, in the panel conversation a bit later uh, in the program. In Senegal, fortification of wheat flour is mandatory, but does not include zinc. At current compliance level, modeling shows that fortifying wheat flour with zinc would cost $1.40 per year per child aged 6 to 59 months who receives adequate dietary zinc intake due to fortification. In Cameroon, wheat flour is fortified with zinc. The cost per year per child aged 6 to 59 months who achieves adequate dietary zinc intake due to fortification ranges from only 44 cents to 62 cents, depending on the assumed level of compliance with the national standard. Having identified countries where zinc deficiency was a public health problem, as mentioned by Christine, we could classify these countries according to their fortification status. On this slide, focus in on the countries in light blue. There, these are the countries that have mandatory fortification with zinc in place, such as Cameroon, Guatemala, and Tanzania. Note that these countries make up less than half of the 40 countries. The fact that zinc deficiency is a public health problem despite zinc fortification may not mean that fortification is not working, but there, there is room for improvement in one or many factors of the program or that complementary strategies are needed. More about this in other presentations. Next, we have the 12 countries which have mandatory fortification, but where zinc is not included in the standard such as Colombia, Nepal, and Senegal. These countries already have national policies on industrial fortification for processed flowers and can leverage their processing infrastructure and technical capacity to include zinc. Adding zinc to their existing fortification programs uh, of either wheat flour, maize flour, or rice would be a relatively low cost, high impact intervention to reduce the national prevalence of zinc deficiency. Lastly, 11 of these 40 countries do not have a large scale food fortification program or have voluntary standards. These countries could benefit from establishing mandatory fortification. Note that this analysis is not subnational and does not capture state level adoption of mandatory fortification, such as, um, for example, the adoption of fortification of wheat with zinc and other micronutrients in some states of Pakistan. So in conclusion, this overview shows that food fortification with zinc is effective, safe, and cost-effective, but that less than half of the countries where zinc deficiency is a public health problem are using this strategy to reduce the prevalence of zinc deficiency. And with that, I would like to say thank you to the uh, members of the Zinc Fortification Task Force for making this work possible. And thank you, Marie, for that um, input. Uh, so we know where we are in terms of zinc fortification. Now, the next question that you might have is, if we move the needle, where will that take us and what will the, be the potential impact? And for that, I would like to introduce Ryan Wessels, who will take us through the next presentation that will address that question. So over to you, Ryan. I think you're on, you're on mute currently, I can't hear you. Thank you. Okay, that so helps. Today, I will be presenting results from analyses we have conducted to estimate the prevalence of inadequate zinc intake and the potential impacts of improving and expanding current large-scale food fortification programs in countries where zinc deficiency is a public health problem. As mentioned previously, data from nationally representative surveys of plasma zinc concentration which is one of the recommended biomarkers of zinc status in low and middle income countries are limited. And data are currently available for 26 low and middle income countries. In the absence of data on plasma zinc concentration, 
at, or information on usual dietary intakes from dietary surveys, a proxy indicator of population level risk of zinc deficiency has been suggested. And this indicator combines estimates of dietary zinc availability in the national food supply based on national food balance sheet data from the Food and Agricultural Organization with data on the prevalence of stunting among children less than five years of age. So based on data from both national surveys of plasma zinc concentrations or this proxy indicator, as mentioned previously, 40 countries have been identified as having zinc deficiency as a public health problem. So the objectives of this current analysis were to use the food balance sheet data in a novel way to estimate the potential effect of improving existing large-scale food fortification programs or establishing new ones on the estimated prevalence of inadequate intake, zinc intake in these 40 countries. We used four different modeling scenarios to accomplish these objectives. First, we estimated country-specific prevalences of inadequate zinc intake, accounting for large-scale food fortification programs as they're currently being implemented. And this was based on available data. The food fortification programs we looked at were for wheat flour, maize flour, and rice. And that's true for all the subsequent scenarios. Next, in countries where zinc deficiency was identified as a public health problem, we estimated the potential effect of improving the existing large-scale zinc fortification programs for cereal grains or establishing new ones. And to accomplish this objective, we modeled three different scenarios. And I just want to reiterate that these scenarios were only applied to the countries where zinc deficiency was identified as a public health problem. So the first scenario is the full compliance scenario. This scenario retains existing zinc fortification standards for each country, but it models the effect of achieving full industry compliance with these standards. So in effect, this scenario will change the estimates of inadequate zinc intake only for the 17 countries identified as having zinc deficiency as a public health problem that also currently have mandatory fortification standards in place that include zinc as a fortificant. The second scenario is the aligning standard scenario. And this scenario adds zinc to existing cereal grain standards if it's not already included, or aligns the existing standards which already include zinc fortification to reflect current international guidelines or recommendations. This scenario assumes no changes to industry compliance. So in effect, this scenario will change the estimates of inadequate zinc intake for the 29 countries identified as having zinc deficiency as a public health problem, which have mandatory fortification standards already in place, whether or not they include zinc currently. And finally, the third scenario is the new and aligned standards with full compliance scenario. This scenario models establishing new standards, adding zinc to existing standards, and or aligning existing standards to reflect current international guidelines or recommendations for both wheat flour, maize flour, and rice, while also achieving full industry compliance. And so this scenario will change the estimates of inadequate zinc intake for all 40 countries identified as having zinc deficiency as a public health problem. In case you're wondering a bit about how we did this, I want to give you a brief overview of our methods. So we obtained country-specific data from the FAO food balance sheets on the average daily per capita quantity of foods available for human consumption in each country. And then we calculated the zinc and phytate contents of each food. Now for these analyses, we use data from GFDX to estimate the additional zinc from the fortification of cereal grains. Um, and so to estimate the additional zinc from fortification as it's currently being implemented, we multiplied the zinc standard for each country by the percent of cereal grain, which is industrially processed, by the reported compliance for each food commodity. And we use these data to estimate the total zinc content of the daily food supply. We then calculated the estimated population zinc requirements weighted by age and sex distribution of each country's population and using recommendations developed by iZinc. And then we compared the zinc content of the daily food supply with the population zinc requirements and estimated the percent of the population that was at risk of inadequate zinc intake. And so we ran through these methods separately for each modeling scenario that I already presented. So what did we find? Before we go into the estimated effects of improving existing programs or establishing new ones, it's actually really interesting to see where we are right now as compared to if we had no large-scale food fortification programs. And so globally, we don't see a large impact of current large-scale food fortification programs on the estimated prevalence of inadequate zinc intake. So we go from about 16.5% to 15%. And 
And this is likely because the majority of the 40 countries where zinc deficiency is considered to be a public health problem don't have mandatory fortification standards, which include zinc. So for example, the estimated prevalence of inadequate zinc intake remains very high in South Asia, where only Afghanistan has a mandatory national level fortification standard, which includes zinc. But there are a couple of regions where current large-scale food fortification programs may be having an impact on the prevalence of inadequate zinc intake. So for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 16 out of 45 countries have mandatory large-scale food fortifications, which already include zinc. And here we see the estimated prevalence of inadequate zinc intake goes from about 22% to 16.5% when current programs are accounted for. This slide now shows the possible effects of modifying current large-scale food fortification programs in the 40 countries where zinc deficiency is a public health problem. First, if countries with current mandatory programs achieved full compliance, and then second, if countries with current mandatory programs aligned their standards with current international guidelines. Again, these scenarios don't show a large global impact on reducing the estimated prevalence of inadequate zinc intake. And this can be in part because the current large-scale food fortification programs are not optimized meaning that even with full compliance, zinc standards might not exist or are not aligned with international guidelines. Or in the second scenario, even with aligned zinc fortification standards, compliance is subpar. It's also because many countries with a large population at risk of inadequate zinc intake don't have mandatory large-scale food fortification programs in place at this moment. However, I did wanna mention that here we're talking about global estimates. And of course, the story would vary for individual countries. So for example, in the aligned standard scenario, 29 of the 40 countries have mandatory fortification standards in place. And 20 of these would see an estimated relative reduction in the prevalence of inadequate zinc intake in their country greater than 25% when compared to their current program. And only two of these countries would still be considered to have zinc as a public health problem based on food balance sheet data. In this final scenario, we are looking at the possible effect if the 40 countries with zinc deficiency is identified as a public health problem were to implement large-scale food fortification programs with wheat, maize, and rice fortified with zinc to current guidelines and 100% compliance of all industrially processed cereal grains. Now we recognize that this is an optimized scenario and it shows us what could be achieved, but not necessarily what a country would choose to implement programmatically for a variety of reasons, including population specific food vehicle processing and consumption patterns, costs, risks, risks of excess, et cetera. However, it is interesting to note that in this idealized scenario, the estimated global prevalence of inadequate zinc intake would decrease by approximately 50%, from 15 to 7.5%. And in countries where zinc deficiency is considered a public health problem, so those 40 countries, the risk of inadequate zinc intake would decrease by about 78%. To look at it in another way, by ensuring large-scale food fortification of cereal grains in which standards are aligned with WHO or international guidelines and full compliance for industrially processed cereals, our modeling shows that we're able to shift all but one country away from zinc deficiency be being a public health problem. And the estimated number of individuals globally at risk of inadequate zinc intake would decline from about 1.1 billion to about five, 560 million. In conclusion, we used a novel approach to the analysis of national food balance sheet data to demonstrate the potential for zinc fortification to have a significant impact on estimated dietary zinc intake in countries where zinc deficiency is a public health problem. If investments are made to improve industry compliance, expand large-scale food fortification programs to include zinc, align zinc standards with international guidelines, and introduce mandatory large-scale food fortification programs in countries without current programs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was um, clear and very helpful. And the fact or the bottom line that we can have the magnitude of the problem is really striking and should be a, um, a lead to a call to action for us. And we appreciate you walking us through the data and the implications of that. Um, so in terms of um, what to do about this and what our individual roles are, I would like to uh, now welcome Fred Grant, uh, who will take us through a, a call to action and some suggested actions for countries and uh, organizations. So Fred, um, over to you.
Thank you, Mdu, and hello, everyone. Um, let me get this in presentation mode. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, building off of sort of the, the previous presentations on the global burden of zinc deficiency, the status of zinc fortification, uh, and its potential for impact, I'm going to be discussing some of the actions that countries can take where zinc deficiency presents a, a public health problem. Um, so different actions can be taken based on the status of zinc fortification in terms of current fortification programs with zinc, those without zinc, um, as well as in countries without mandatory fortification. Um, and to begin, um, I want to review some of the key enablers and barriers that were recently identified uh, by Anne Tarini and other members uh, of the iZinc Fortification Task Force in a review that assessed 10 LMICs, which, had, which each had a documented risk of inadequate zinc intake, as well as mandatory food fortification in place. Uh, factors which supported or impeded the inclusion of zinc in the fortification standard were identified, and those are summarized in, uh, in the table on the screen here. So common enablers included technical assistance from implementing partner data on zinc deficiency, existing global or regional fortification standards, uh, the affordability to the public and the private sector, uh, and the of organoleptic changes during the fortification process. Barriers included an absence of technical support, a lack of deficiency data, a lack or uh, inadequate zinc or micronutrient strategies, um, a lack of regional guidelines, regional or global guidelines uh, with zinc, particularly at the time of the initial regulation, lack of efficacy data on zinc fortification, and then finally just weak fortification programs overall. And so while these findings are relevant to countries with mandatory standards in place, they also provide some important insight to countries uh, that are considering fortification. And similarly, I think published a call to action with a problem uh, can take. And on the right side of this slide, you can see that these are oriented to national governments, including ministries of health, uh, industry, finance, et cetera, regional bodies like the Economic Community of West African States or the Ex-Health Community, multi and bilateral uh, institutions, non-governmental organizations, donors, and industry. Um, and these actions are grouped around governance, the policy environment, stakeholder engagement, uh, and resource mobilization to strengthen fortification programs, um, as well as the tools, the guidelines, the evidence generation, uh, and technical resources that are required for to ensure successful implementation. And then lastly, the important role that quality assurance, quality control, as well as monitoring and evaluation play in assuring uh, compliance and accountability documenting effectiveness and measuring impact. Uh, and in organizing these actions based on country fortification status, there's some common priorities that cut across countries and there's others that are more relevant to specific states of fortification. So in this table, we've organized uh, countries where the actions by countries with mandatory fortification without zinc on the left column, mandatory zinc fortification in the center, and then countries without mandatory fortification on the right. And while it may seem like low-hanging fruit to target countries with existing mandatory standards without zinc, um, it is by no means a simple or a quick process to update a fortification standard. It does take time. It requires a significant stakeholder engagement, a strong enabling environment, an active fortification alliance, a willing uh, industry and consumer demand. Importantly, data is also critical to establish the evidence base of zinc deficiency or that risk of inadequate intake. So, can, and as we all know, surveys is time consuming, it's costly. At the same time, it offers strong justification for countries to take action to address a, a documented burden. On the other hand, proxy indicators uh, of the risk of inadequate intake or modeled burden also uh, provide options. They, they can be more affordable options, but they also require additional explanation of the methods and interpretation to facilitate understanding and to generate that political buy-in um, for action at the country level. 
regardless of the evidence method, I think it's important to highlight the, the role that universities that research institutes play in that data generation. Additionally, it's important to determine the reach or the coverage um, that current vehicles have to deliver zinc to those most at risk of deficiency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, zinc specifically, micronutrients more broadly, um, as priority nutrients within national nutrition policies is also important. And both the public and the private sector are going to want to know uh, and understand what are the costs and what are the supply chain implications of a new standard of adding a new micronutrient to the form remix. Countries with mandatory fortification uh, with zinc and where zinc health issue. We really need to understand the performance of the fortification program in terms of its coverage, its quality, uh, and its compliance. And this involves assessing industry practices as well as sleep control uh, agency capacity and monitoring. Also, we need to ask the question, are the food vehicles delivering enough zinc and being consumed uh, by populations at greatest risk of insufficient intake? And if not, do we need to consider adjusting the fortification levels? Food consumption patterns change over time, and there may be a need for fortification levels to be adjusted accordingly. Um, at the same time, we also need to ask the question, do we need to consider other food vehicles? Um, cereals are commonly fortified with zinc, but we know that, for instance, wheat flour tends to reach more urban populations. Rice fortification is expanding. It often includes zinc as well. But there's also research on new vehicles, like multiply fortified salt, fortified bullion. And in some geographies, these vehicles are centrally processed. And they're also consumed by a very large proportion of the population, often higher than cereals. And so this offers the potential for higher coverage and higher intake. Uh, and this speaks to the important role that R&D plays in fortification and micronutrient interventions. We often think of industry as just producing a product, but they're also investing in developing new innovations and then partnering with those researchers to test and prove them. Another consideration is whether the food vehicles are limited to markets that aren't accessed by those most vulnerable populations. And if so, additional delivery channels like social safety net programs may need to be considered. India is a good, import, a good example of large-scale delivery of fortified foods to, through social protection platforms. Um, and then we need to recognize that and, and look beyond uh, large-scale food fortification. No single micronutrient intervention will meet all needs everywhere. And so improve dietary diversity, greater agriculture production diversity, uh, so that more nutrient-rich foods are available and affordable, zinc biofortified crops like maize, wheat, or rice, um, as well as micronutrient supplementation all play complementary roles to large-scale food fortification. And lastly, advocacy will likely play an important role in all of this policy, innovation, delivery, and quality discussions. Um, in countries with no mandatory fortification, um, basically, all of the above applies. We need to consider a lot. Um, we need the evidence generation to document the risk and the burden. We need a strong enabling environment where zinc and micronutrient deficiencies are prioritized through multiple interventions, and then the technical, the financial resources to support large-scale food fortification. Um, and fortification takes time. So in these settings in particular, those complementary strategies like supplementation, biofortification, diversification will be critical. Um, in closing, there are several cross-cutting themes um, in terms of the, the prioritized actions for addressing zinc deficiency through food fortification. I think data and evidence are critical. And like dietary patterns, they do, they're not static and they do need uh, reassessment. Alignment and coordination across public and private sectors, along with civil society, donors, and academia is also essential. Um, nutrient delivery through food vehicles that reach those most at risk of inadequate intake and have high coverage across the population is essential for shifting the overall burden. And then a suite of complementary multi-sector micronutrient interventions across the food and the health systems is also key. Uh, and with that, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for a clear set of actions and a clear set of recommendations for us to consider and ideally act on. Appreciate the perspective.
So at this point, we'll move from a series of presentations to a conversation that's centered on country experiences with food fortification and with zinc in particular. And with that in mind, we will uh, focus on two countries where it's estimated that zinc deficiency is a public health problem. So I would like to call to the floor Ande Fatu and uh, Alex Jepayi uh, for this um, uh, conversation. Yeah, uh, you. You, can, you can go on. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Nde. I appreciate you. you joining me on the stage. Um, by way of, um, of, of introduction, I'll, I'll just introduce you and then we can dive in. So uh, Dr. Nde Fatu is um, a coordinator of, Senegal, uh, of the Senegalese Committee of Food Fortification uh, with the government of Senegal. And um, uh, Alex Njebayi is a uh, uh, was uh, 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 is with Helen Keller International, formerly in Cameroon, uh, but currently based in Niger. So thank you for the time. And the um, reason uh, why we have you um, uh, on the stage is that um, Senegal is a country that has a uh, fortification in place, but where zinc has not been included up until now. And Cameroon is a country where zinc was included as one of the fortifications uh, from the outset and where a, a marked uh, reduction in zinc deficiency was shown after one year of the program. So we'll uh, dig into the reasons why um, we, uh, uh, we have that state of affairs and how we proceed from, uh, from there in your respective country. So starting with you, Nde, if you can, uh, if I can uh, focus. Mm -hmm. uh, could you take us back to the early days when Senegal began discussing food fortification? So. Uh, in brief, how did you navigate the decision-making process for selecting vehicles? Um, uh, and uh, I've also heard that there was an interesting twist uh, in terms of the exclusion of zinc in the regional standards based on a study in uh, young children in Senegal. Could you shed some light on those perspectives and that influence? Thank you, Mudu. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here and share with you. Senegal uh, is one of the countries who get uh, national uh, public health of uh, nutrition program, including uh, large food fortification. We get uh, salt iodization mandatory since uh, 1994 and uh, vegetable oil and also wheat flour were mandatory since uh, 2009. But uh, Senegal uh, make a lot of effort, really significant effort were made and uh, micronutrient deficiency decreased, but it remained a public health uh, problem. In uh, 2010, when we make our national uh, baseline, we see that uh, 50 person among uh, preschool children and uh, 59 uh, person women among uh, women who are of reproductive age were de zinc deficient but uh, we don't make uh, any intervention to address uh, uh, zinc deficiency except mnps for some children but uh, right now senegal uh, national nutrition development council is currently writing his uh, 2023 20, to 2028 20, national strategic plan. And also the National Alliance of Food Fortification is writing his uh, national uh, strategic plan. The two plans are in progress. And uh, in the two plans, one of the main objective is to decrease micronutrient deficiency, including zinc. At the beginning of uh, fortification, we wanted to include zinc in the, in, uh, as a micronutrient, but uh, it was not possible. When we discussed with uh, policymaker and stakeholder, we were in a regional context, and in a regional context, we cannot uh, go alone. It was a concern in our country, in our country, my Senegal, but perhaps not in the other countries. That is why at this moment, 
we did not include Zeg, but uh, it remained a, 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 a concern. Uh, in a consensual manner with the other country, we adopt fortification of wheat flour with uh, iron and, uh, and folic acid. But we have now, right now, to move on and uh, continue to push again our national standards to be in touch with the uh, ECOWAS uh, committee uh, to review the standards uh, for including zinc uh, uh, in it. Uh, I think uh, for now, perhaps uh, I am waiting for another question. No problem there. Thank I will you. come back to you on the current status. It's good to get that historical perspective and the role of the regional conversations in determining uh, the status of um, Zin fortification then. Uh, now turning to you, uh, Alex, uh, Cameroon took a different route by introducing mandatory fortification of oil and wheat in 2011. So what led to this decision and why did you uh, did uh, uh, you choose to uh, include zinc among the fortificants for wheat flour? Uh, can you share share some insights on um, the out uh, the process of this decision and some of the outcomes? Thank you, Ndu, for this question. Thank you, everyone. Good, uh, good, uh, good, 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 good evening. Okay, in Niger, it's night now. So, uh, yes, thank you for for the question. What I, what I can say is that according to the movement of fortification we were having in the uh, first 10 years, first decade of 2000, Cameroon has um, identified that um, there is a need of uh, improving microchip status of the population because we we had uh, we did the microchip survey of vitamin A. The, the level of uh, deficiency among children was very high, more than the, than the, than 35 percent among children. It was a huge problem, and the level of stunting also was so high. And uh, when we were not having data. And uh, the country engaged was engaged to to start a qualification program, but prior to that we did uh, a microchip survey, a refresh in 2009, and we discovered that more than 46 percent of women was uh, uh, deficient in, in plasma in low plasma zinc, and uh, also the the two girls were 29 percent, uh, you know. Uh, Deficiency. So this encouraged us to, to take zinc as other uh, micronutrients as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as, as fortifications for, for food fortification. And according to the WHO guidelines, the scientists from, from Cameroon, with the help of, uh, of, uh, of Isaac and, uh, and um, not, notably uh, Kenneth Brown, who was, who was our our, our, our advisor of that time decided to include um, uh, zinc, advocate to include zinc into the premise for wet flour. This was doing uh, normally because we, 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 we were having data to, to support that, to advocate for that. And uh, in 2011, when we started fortification, uh, we include mandatory fortification of zinc uh, in, uh, in wheat flour. And uh, fortunately, we are having money to do um, an interim uh, impact survey one year later. And uh, we had a, a very impressive uh, reduction of, uh, but the, 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 interim, the, the interim survey was done just in big cities, around the, well, the two big cities of Cameroon, who was having the highest consumption rates of wheat flour. More than 90% of the population was eating wheat flour. So the impact was uh, directly uh, uh, you know, uh, visible. So we had a reduction of, uh, uh, we, 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 we came down from 46% to 28 among children and 39% to 21 among women. It was really huge uh, for us, it encouraged us to, to maintain the program, the, the education program. So, uh, as I said, 
is more than 10 years now that the program is still ongoing. There is problems of control because after 11 years now, we need to know exactly uh, what is the level of, uh, of, uh, of deficiencies among, among children. But as you know, analysts are closely and we are still struggling to to monitor the project, the, 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 the program, the, 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 the education in the country. Uh, so that's the story behind the fortification of zinc in Cameroon in, uh, in with, 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 with flour. So thank you, if there is a question, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Just a quick follow-up. So I take it from you that it's hard to tell if those, the early impacts have been sustained over time. Uh, I, yes, because uh, what I, I, I said is that, unfortunately, the only thing we, we were able to, to, uh, to do according to the money available and to the commitment of the government was market survey and household survey. We didn't have chance to, 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 to do this analysis, this deep analysis of plasma zinc, uh, mm -hmm. because we were unable to have money to, to, do, to do that. That's why we are still uh, looking uh, for, for conducting a national survey 10 years after us to know exactly what is the impact among the population. But for what we know, the latest uh, survey that we did is that uh, it's clear that there is some imported flour in the country, but mm -hmm. all, the, all the producers of wheat flour in the country are still fortifying at almost the right level. So this can say, can means that uh, the level of, uh, you know, diminution of deficiency was sustained. So, but we need to, to evaluate it to an yeah. impact survey. That's where we are now. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. Thank you, Alex, for those perspectives. Um, now, turning back to you, Nde, um, if we fast forward, uh, to today, I and mean, you mentioned the 23 to 28 action plan uh, that's currently um, uh, underway. Um, but I would like to hear from you uh, what's on the discussion table uh, in Senegal regarding food fortification. And then with uh, emerging evidence uh, supporting zinc fortification, that might um, override uh, the earlier concerns, hopefully. Uh, how has this influenced regional standard discussions? And um, uh, are there any specific actions that are being considered uh, and any specific vehicles that are being considered for zinc fortification? Um, quite a, a number of questions bundled in there, but uh, over to you for your feedback. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Medu. Yes, we, we are uh, discussing on uh, how we can move on. With the, our national uh, strategic plan, it is clear that we, we are going to introduce the reduction of zinc, but we are going to show how to do it effectively. And the most and the main way is to change our standards. And we are on it. We are going to discuss with the National Standard Office to introduce the request in the regional level at the ECOWAS level, because we are in in a in a region we are we adopt harmonized norm. We cannot go alone, and mm -hmm. in the regional level we can discuss and amend our harmonized standard. Perhaps it is also zinc deficiency is also a public health problem in the other country. And they are going to see if uh, we can move together and change uh, our standards to help our population. Thank you. So there's room for discussion there. Um, uh, do you envision that these conversations will be happening? Just sorry to put you on the spot with that question. So I was asking, you envision that these questions will be happening at the regional level moving forward? Is that correct? Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. And uh, they are just going to amend the, the, the standard we get right now. It is not mm -hmm. a problem. And we get Minimod. The Minimod tool help us to, to see what, uh, 
what micronutrient and how we can uh, put it in mm. our flour uh, and uh, decrease the cost. And uh, the evaluation is uh, very useful for our, our population and uh, the, the, those who make standards. I don't know if I respond to your question. You did. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, my takeaway from um, uh, from our conversation uh, right now is essentially the need for evidence, uh, the uh, the need for evidence in terms of what the need is and what the opportunity is, um, and then uh, the um, uh, importance of trade um, and regional standards as a conversation in terms of alignment, especially where there are, there's there's a lot of regional interaction. Uh, and what I've heard from the both of you as well is the need for multi-stakeholder action and the role of partnerships in terms of um, uh, interpreting data. I think you just referenced Minimod, which we've heard about earlier, and uh, you you mentioned the uh, Isaac earlier, Alex as well. Uh, and then the need for uh, monitoring uh, so that we can track. Uh, how um, uh, fortification is um, is tracking over time and monitoring also uh, changes in zinc status. Any other points that I left out that you would want to share with them, with listeners, colleagues? Yeah. Uh, for my end, I think you, you summarized very well what uh, I wanted to, to share with the, with the panel. And uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say that to, to have this uh, fortification of zinc uh, really uh, working in the country, we need a strong, a strong commitment of the country, of the country uh, decision makers, uh, notably the Minister of Health, the private sectors, which who have to support the cost of zinc, and uh, the ministry, the, the whole partners to monitor, evaluate, and uh, uh, share, discuss all the results that we have in between the, the project. All these things put together can uh, help really a country to to know to to, to reduce the the the, the zinc deficiency among populations. That's that's what I wanted to do today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for sharing your perspectives and taking the time. I know it's late in the day for you both, but I appreciate um you coming on board and um sharing your insights with us. Um Thank so you. for now we will um uh, switch to questions and answers. Uh, some There are some questions in the chat, so I think we can uh, pull up some of them in the limited time that we have left. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for keeping engaged. You can keep the questions coming. If we don't get to them, we'll answer them um, uh, 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 separately. So I'll call on Kristin for the uh, first uh, question that, um, that, we, that we got on the chat. And if you can uh, respond to the question around uh, whether fortification issues can be approached on a combined basis, um, such as folate and not uh, limited to uh, zinc, and the fact that folate uh, results in neural tube uh, birth defects, uh, which is uh, um, uh, deleterious as well. So if you can maybe address that perspective, thanks. Sure, thanks, M2. Um, yes, absolutely. We are not advocating for um, zinc as the sole fortificant in any large-scale food fortification approach and would, in, in converse, advocate for uh, fortification with multiple micronutrients, um, folic acid being one, you know, iron being another, um, depending on the vehicle, possibly iodine. Um, it will, of course, depend on which micronutrient deficiencies are prevalent. Um, in the country or in the population of interest um, and choice of vehicles and sources of different micronutrients in the diet. So yes, absolutely advocating for um, zinc alongside other micronutrients in which deficiencies um, are, are high and um, for, where fortification could be an appropriate strategy. Thank you, Kristen. Um, uh, there are two questions that I would like to direct to Marie, if you can. Uh, join me on the stage, Marie. Um, so the first one uh, is that, um, and there's a comment uh, and a question that it, I think it's very important to consider uh, and focus on alternative complementary interventions beyond fortification, like agronomic biofortification of staple uh, crops uh, as a specific example, especially in developing countries. 
So what do you think about it? And then I'll ask you the next question so that you can address the both of them in one fell swoop. Uh, there's a question about the case of India where if, uh, our fortification is voluntary. So how should one implement zinc fortification in the existing food systems and evaluation strategies? Over to you, Mary. Thank you. That was a lot at once. But uh, firstly, about the uh, complementarity, uh, really good question. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, that industrial food fortification works when the vehicle is widely consumed uh, uh, by all population groups in sufficient amounts and is properly fortified. And um, in countries where um, the industrial uh, per percentage that of, of the staple food that is industrial processed is low, um, biofortification, which was posed in the, in the example, um, can play a very important role alongside the full uh, kind of uh, yeah. range of strategies uh, as mentioned by Christine. Uh, we, um, in biofortification, less zinc is delivered um, from the crop, uh, but there is some evidence of impact. So absolutely uh, a very good question. And um, thank you for bringing up, you know, the, the focus on, on complementarity of strategies. Um, uh, with regards to, uh, with regards to uh, India, uh, MD, would you mind repeating the question? Thanks. Sorry, um, I asked. Yeah. I asked my, yeah. I asked myself the question, which is not very helpful to you. Uh, so, in yeah, the question was: in the case of India, fortification is voluntary. How should one implement? Uh, how should one implement zinc fortification in the existing food systems and evaluation yeah. strategies? Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge the the, the very uh, like quite unique to, to India and a few other countries of the implementation of food fortification and social protection, uh, some, which is reaching millions of people um, and the most vulnerable, um, which is which is fantastic. And uh, uh, I think uh, when it comes to through social protection, uh, if zinc is not included um, as a, um, uh, sometimes um, there is a, some core micronutrients that have to be included in the food that is served through the programs and some that are optional. So one first, if zinc was optional, uh, it would be to make, uh, to make uh, zinc uh, a core or mandatory nutrient um, in those programs. Um, and 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 then generally speaking, as mentioned in the presentations, uh, that the recommendation is to move from voluntary to mandatory fortification, um, and that has the most impact. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate it. Um, for the next uh, two questions, I'll invite Fred uh, to respond to these. Um, Thank you, Fred. Uh, so the first uh, question, I'll ask them both at the same time, and then you can address them sequentially. Uh, so uh, one colleague asked, why is uh, it that um, uh, countries with uh, mandatory zinc fortification are still uh, experiencing zinc uh, uh, deficiency? And uh, there was um, uh, another question uh, as well. Uh, which uh, which was that uh, uh, chemically and empirically in which form of zinc uh, is effective uh, in the fortification process? If you can address those two questions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. So on the on the questions of countries with uh, micronutrient fortification but still high levels of micronutrient deficiencies, I think it's just important to state that. Fortification is not designed to meet 100% of the daily uh, needs. Um, and in addition to that, people who are most vulnerable, who are 
uh, most at risk of these deficiencies have increased uh, increased needs um, and maybe increased exposure to other um, uh, to other factors that could affect their absorption. So I think this is also one of the reasons why we need to be looking at some of these issues that uh, Ryan mentioned around the phytates, the anti-nutrients, but also importantly, why we need um, additional interventions, these complementary interventions, um, whether it's dietary diversity, whether it's uh, biofortification or micronutrient supplements, micronutrient powders as well as um, alternative strategies. Uh, in terms of the form of, of zinc that's used in fortification in the WHO uh, guidelines, there are three forms of zinc uh, that are listed, zinc oxide, zinc sulfate, zinc acetate, um, and the levels that they're recommended is based on the flour extraction rate, but also the per capita consumption, different levels of per capita consumption. And so with that, um, then you can look at either which form of zinc to use and at what level um, in the flower fortification. Thanks. Thank you, Fred, for that. I think we're at time, um, uh, well, close to time. So we'll stop there with the questions. I appreciate uh, all of the engagement and the questions that you've put into the Q&A function. Uh, while we didn't get to all of them, we will follow up with um, with with uh, uh, a Q and A document um, uh, after uh, uh, when we send a post attendance uh, email. Uh, so um, now, as we wrap up today's uh, discussion, I'd like for us to take a moment to reflect on a few things. Uh, to reflect on the global landscape of zinc deficiency. So we've heard today that it's estimated to be a public health concern. Uh, in 40 countries, and that this concern is concentrated primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. But there's a new call to action. Uh, the World Health Assembly has urged member states uh, recently to fast track large-scale food fortification as a crucial weapon in our battle against micronutrient deficiencies. So imagine this, if we're to fully embrace fortification of staple foods with zinc in all 40 affected countries, we could potentially slash the percentage of people at risk of inadequate zinc intake by a whopping 50%, uh, half it, uh, it essentially. Now, that's not just a statistic. It's a game changer for public health. So let's uh, take um, uh, this into cognizance as we consider uh, our um, programs and our actions and our priorities. But let's be clear. I think as we heard in our presentations and in some of the Q&A discussions today, Zinc fortification isn't a magic cure. It won't single-handedly wipe out zinc deficiency, even though there's potential for impact. But what it can do is pretty remarkable. So by improving a dietary zinc intake on a population level, we're talking about tangible health improvements for communities. Uh, there are several resources that are available on, um, on our website, and we'll uh, show them on the screen uh, shortly, uh, that you can interact with and see um, more details and more materials over and above what we've covered today. So the story hasn't ended and the conversation hasn't ended really if you uh, visit our website and um, interact with some of the materials and engage with, um, with, 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 uh, with all of us, uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to continue the conversation offline uh, um, certainly. And we will share links to all of these with um, you all after the webinar. And I believe that uh, a link to the presentations will be included also in the post attendance um, uh, email. So as we conclude uh, today's webinar, I ask that we keep this momentum going. The power to make a difference is really in our hands and together we can step closer to a healthier and zinc adequate wo uh, world. So I would like to thank you all for joining the conversation today. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for their time and preparation. And I would like to also thank the organizing committee for keeping us to task and keeping us um, uh, honest and making it run relatively uh, uh, seamlessly, apart from the mute and mute uh, snuffles that we experienced. Um, but I ask that we continue this journey towards a better, um, uh, to, towards better global nutrition. So on this note, um, I wish you all a wonderful day and wish you all happy holidays and a happy close to the year.
Thank you, panelists, and thank you, speakers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues.